next, CityNet 30 takes you downtown for the weekly luncheon meeting of the City Club of Fort Lauderdale. Live weekly coverage of City Club is made possible in part by TCI and is produced through the facilities of Portland Cable Access. Now we join the City Club for this week's program. Good afternoon. Welcome to the City Club of Portland. I'm Pete Heuser, your president. As you know, today we're going to hear from Stephen McConnell of the Alzheimer's Association in Washington, D.C., and he'll talk to us about the incalculable costs of Alzheimer's disease. Our program today is sponsored by Washington Mutual Savings Bank, Kaiser Permanente, and the law firm of Miller, Nash, Wiener, Hager, and Carlson. We're very grateful for, th for their support. Next week on April 30th, Dick Benner, the director of the Oregon Department of Land Conservation, will talk to us about livability in or Oregon's landscape. That'll be here at the Multnomah Club. Um, some of you might have seen, or hopefully many of you saw in our recent bulletin, we're looking for volunteers for a couple of uh, studies that are just going to be getting started soon. One of them is on charter schools, and the other is on affordable housing. Now, for uh, some of you uh, longtime City Club members that haven't uh, participated in a study, one of these might be ones for you. As you know, you don't need to know anything about these topics. The whole process is to become informed on the issues and to be able to render an unbiased decision on, uh, on what should be done about the problem. Or if you're a new member and you've never done anything like this, I think you might enjoy it. If you want to know what's involved, talk to, uh, talk to another City Club member. Most of us have been involved in these studies at one time or another. Or call the club office, and uh, Paul Leisner, the research director over here, can, uh, can help you with any questions you might have about it. Today our board host is Carol Stone. Carol is executive director of the Regional Drug Initiative. She'll ask the first question of our speaker today. After Carol's question, we'll take a question from Louis Simpson. Louis is co-chair of the Healthcare Issue Committee of the City Club. He'll ask the second question, and then after that, we'll open it up to City Club members in the audience. Of course, keep your questions to 30 seconds, please. Now, it's a pleasure to be able to introduce Steve McConnell. Um, we were talking here uh, over our lunches about some experiences both uh, Carol and I have had with our families. I know uh, when my grandparents uh, uh, were uh, in their 70s, my grandfather was uh, suffering from uh, severe dementia that probably was Alzheimer's. Back then, we just called it senility. But uh, they had a lot of trouble, and my grandmother tried to take care of him. It was very difficult. And there weren't many options then about how to, how to attend to people that had Alzheimer's. Uh, now we're fortunate in Oregon, uh, there are facilities that have been specifically designed for handling Alzheimer's patients. I know in the last couple of years, uh, Legacy Hospitals has opened a facility called St. Aidan's Place, and there's another facility called Expressions in Northeast Portland that, that uh, appear to be uh, what was needed. And uh, you might have seen in the Oregonian uh, articles a few weeks ago that both Parkinson's and Alzheimer's diseases are, uh, are much, higher, much higher incidence here in Oregon than elsewhere in the country. Even discounting for the fact that we do have many retirees here, the incidence is higher, and uh, not, sure, not sure why that is. Uh, Stephen McConnell is Vice President for Public Policy of the Alzheimer's Association. It's a national volunteer organization with more than 200 chapters and 45,000 volunteers nationwide. He directs the association's Washington, D.C.-based public policy off office. He's also a member of the board and past executive director of the Long-Term Care Campaign, a coalition of 140 different organizations and hundreds of local groups pressing for comprehensive national programs on long-term care. Previously, Dr. McConnell uh, had worked with Congress as staff director of the U.S. Senate Special Committee on Aging and for the U.S. House of Representatives uh, Select Committee on Aging. So he's very qualified to talk to us about this topic. 
Before coming to Washington, D.C. in 1980, Dr. McConnell held a research associate appointment to the internationally known Andrus Gerontology Center of the University of Southern California, and he received his PhD in sociology from the University of Southern California. So let's welcome Dr. Stephen McConnell to the City Club of Portland. Thank you, Pete. It's great to be in Portland. Uh, it's a beautiful city. It's a beautiful day. I assume the weather's like this all the time. <laughs> there are two other reasons why I'm glad to be here. Uh, one is that it's not Washington, D.C. And right now in Washington, you probably know there is a NATO summit, the 50th anniversary of NATO. And there are 19 world uh, uh, leaders there, uh, as well as 23 leaders from 23 other nations. And the gridlock from the motorcades and all the activity uh, will be horrendous. In fact, there's about a 20 square block area around the White House that is, uh, they've encouraged federal workers, they've given them the day off, they've encouraged businesses to close. We're about three blocks from the White House, <clears throat> our office, so our office is closed. Um, it's, we don't have anything to do with NATO, but we wanted to spare our people having to deal with that. So <clears throat> I'm glad to be here. I'm also glad to be in a state <clears throat> that had the good sense to elect and re-elect uh, Senator Hatfield so many times. He is, uh, in my mind, uh, has been set the standard for what statesmen and leaders should be in this country. Uh, the, the rest of the country owes all of you Oregonians a debt of gratitude for the service of Senator Hatfield over those many years. I want to thank the City Club for your invitation to be here today. I mentioned it to a couple of people that uh, know something about Portland, and they said, that's a big deal. I said, that's, a, that's an important organization. There are influential people that are members of the City Club, and uh, I know that to be the case. Uh, one of them, Bob Shoemaker, was uh, your former president, was also a former president of the Oregon Trail chapter, and is someone who has done an enormous amount for the health care system here in Oregon. I would also like to acknowledge those of you here from the Oregon Trail chapter, uh, it's one of our premier chapters in the National Association, one that was one of our oldest chapters, founded in 1982, provides an uh, enormous amount of service information and advocacy uh, to the people here in Portland. And I'd like to thank all of you for being here today. This is a topic that I think touches many of us, more and more of us all the time, not just Alzheimer's, but the experience of being a caregiver. I'd like to begin with three seemingly unrelated subjects, Senator Hatfield, a wedding anniversary, and in the arms of another man's wife. Um, I'll start with that one. Um, I'm the son of a minister, and there is a story among ministers about the son of a minister who himself was a minister, was having trouble keeping his congregation awake. So he asked his father what he could do, and his father said, well, next time they begin to doze, tell them that last night you were in the arms of another man's wife and you'll get their attention immediately. And then you say, it was my mother. So he thought, that's, that's good. So the next Sunday he was preaching and the, saw a few people start to nod off and he said, last night I was in the arms of another man's wife. And everybody's eyes riveted to him. He became enormously flustered and said, but I can't remember who it was. <laughs> so. It relates to our topic today, ten somewhat tenuously, and the problem of remembering things, but also uh, the notion of, of wives and spouses and families and the kind of loyalty and devotion uh, that families have for one another. And that's the second topic, wedding anniversary. Uh, yesterday was my 25th wedding anniversary. I spent it in airports, as did my wife. Unfortunately, it was different airports. We agreed to celebrate our anniversary on a different date because we were both traveling. But the picture on the annual report for the Oregon Trail chapter of a couple on their wedding day embracing, you don't see their face, but you see all the hopes and dreams, the future, the aspirations of this couple captured in that photo. And then the inset photo with the characteristic blank stare of Alzheimer's disease and the caregiver, the, the wife with her arms around her husband, supporting him, providing that emotional and other support 
that families provide. This is a photo of Lucy and Stuart Wells the, uh, in 1952 on their uh, marriage day and then for some 46 years later um, with Stuart having Alzheimer's disease. And I think the, the notion, again, of our topic today is what families do to support each other out of love and devotion. And finally, Senator Hatfield, as I mentioned, not only was he a statesman, but he, he had the, the moniker that we put on people in the Alzheimer's Association. He was a family member. He experienced Alzheimer's disease firsthand. His father died of Alzheimer's disease. And I remember in 1990 at a congressional hearing that he attended, he spoke about his experience with Alzheimer's disease for the first time publicly. People that knew him personally were aware that his father had Alzheimer's disease, but he hadn't spoken about it publicly before. He came to this hearing, it was a, the topic was Alzheimer's, he wasn't prepared to talk about that, but it came out. And he talked about it in, in incredibly emotional and effective ways. It was a result of him talking about his father, six other members of Congress attending that hearing spoke about their experiences. He gave them the license. He gave them the freedom to talk about. We're all a little suspect about our elected officials and whether they're all together or not. So they're reluctant to talk about things like this in their own past. I think Senator Hatfield changed that and then acted on his conviction and his experience and became uh, a leader in support of research on Alzheimer's disease. And it was very effective in increasing the amount of money that we uh, devote to Alzheimer's disease research. <clears throat> I'd like to talk to you about four things today. First of all, Alzheimer's disease, what is it? What do we know about it? What's the future hold? Secondly, I'd like to talk about the hidden long-term care system. What is that? Who are these hidden caregivers? What do they mean to our society? Third, uh, the policy implications of caregiving. And finally, what all of this means to you. Alzheimer's disease is a progressive brain disorder. It's incurable. It's one of the several dementias uh, that people can get. It's the most common form of dementia. It used to be thought of, as, as Pete said, as senility <clears throat> and somehow a normal part of aging. Uh, senility is one of these broad terms that has no real meaning now that we understand the various forms of senile dementia. And we also know that Alzheimer's is not a normal part of aging. It's correlated with aging. It's more common among older people, but it is not caused by aging. The time from onset of Alzheimer's to death, uh, they say averages something like eight years. We, it varies widely uh, from one to two years to as many as 20 or more. The initial symptoms are memory loss that affects your ability to uh, function in everyday life. Uh, difficulty in performing familiar tasks, such as using an appliance, getting lost easily, even in familiar places, poor or decreased judgment, changes in mood, behavior and personality, loss of interest, uh, or lack of initiative. So a lot, of, a lot of us worry when we lose our keys that somehow that's an indication that Alzheimer's has started. It's not a good indication. If you forget what your keys are for, then you might want to contact the Alzheimer's Association chapter. <clears throat> Stuart Aubrey of Westfield, New Jersey, testified before the U.S. Senate last month. Stuart, who spent his life in the newspaper business as an editor and writer, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease four and a half years ago, the age of 56. He begins his testimony by recalling his experience as a page boy in Washington when he witnessed uh, the shooting of a congressman on the floor of the House of Representatives. Stewart's words, little did I know 40 years ago that one day I would be faced with another lethal bullet. The second attack would be a silent bullet and it would eventually kill me. I call it my hidden adversary. Others call it Alzheimer's disease. When the doctor told me of my plight, I was in a state of total shock. My life was now twisting out of control and I felt as if I was heading for a nosedive. That very same day, I was told to stop working and stop driving. I did both. At this point, I cannot add or subtract, so Bev, my wife, takes care of all the business. Although I can understand conversations, it is harder for me to process them. I'm having trouble finding the right words and organizing my thoughts. I tire easily, have trouble making phone calls, feel less confident, and often don't have much to say. 
my past is slipping away from me. The pathology of Alzheimer's disease is plaques and tangles which form in the brain. And the tangles hit the hippocampus part of the brain, which is uh, best thought of as kind of the tape recorder or the, tape, the record button on our uh, tape recorders and tape players. And as the, the, uh, the tangles develop in that part of the brain, the brain has difficulty recording new information. So people can take old tapes off the shelf and replay the old tapes. That's why the characteristic remembrances of things from long ago. But they can't record new things. So um, the areas of the brain associated with movement and speech are frequently left more or less intact. So that a person with Alzheimer's disease, certainly in the early and mid stages, looks normal, sounds normal uh, in their movement, speech, and appearance. We had two 83-year-old twins from Hollywood come to Washington to testify a number of years ago. Beautiful women, looked perfectly normal, and in, even in brief conversations, you couldn't tell that one of them had Alzheimer's disease. Um, the great irony is that one of them looked very tired, as beautiful as she was. She looked exhausted. She was the caregiver. The person with the disease kept saying, I have no care. She was still in the early stages, um, and she forgot the first part of her sentence. The <clears throat> uh, Alzheimer's disease hits people regardless of their social status. Ronald Reagan, former president. Stuart Millen, a Lutheran minister. Ralph McKinney, a rayon factory worker from Ohio, more recently Portland. Dick Norton, a member of Mensa. Eunice Louise Tony, a domestic worker from Washington, D.C. The earliest known case is age 35, but it's more common among people over age 65. About 10% of those over 65 have Alzheimer's disease, and over 85, it's nearly half. Four million people now have the disease, and by the time the 76 million baby boomers hit their oldest age group, as many as 14 million will have the disease unless we find a way to head it off. This is largely a demographic fact. The growth in the number of people with Alzheimer's disease is due to the fact that the population is aging. It's one of the successes of modern medicine and our uh, improving lifestyles and so forth. The people are living longer. They're living long enough to develop Alzheimer's disease. The fastest growing part of the population is those eight, over 85, and with it, there is a dramatic increase in the incidence of Alzheimer's. Oregon has a slightly older population than the nation as a whole. 13.4% of your population is over 65 compared to 12.8% nationally. But interestingly, the, your over 85 population is growing at twice the rate of the rest of the nation. So you're going to see a much bigger increase in, in those uh, diseases related to very old age like Alzheimer's. Currently, there are 62,000 Oregonians that have Alzheimer's disease, and in the next 35 years, that will grow to 210,000 here in the state of Oregon. Some of these people are living in nursing homes. Pete mentioned the, uh, the rise in assisted living and alternative uh, living situations. Some people are living in, in those, in board and care facilities. And thanks to one of the most forward-thinking health care systems in the country, Many Oregonians are able to remain at home, cared for by family and friends in the hidden long-term care system. Alzheimer's disease remains a mystery, but there is hope uh, on the horizon. I'd like to mention three things that are happening in the research front. One, in the area of diagnosis, we're diagnosing people capable of diagnosing people earlier. It used to be a diagnosis of exclusion. Now we can make uh, positive diagnoses that, that are 95% that are accurate. Uh, this becomes important as treatments come online because you have to have a diagnosis so we can treat the disease. Um, there is no simple blood test available for Alzheimer's, despite what you might hear. Uh, there are some things in the works, and it may be at some point that we'll have simpler tests, but it's, it's the process of uh, looking at a person's physical and mental status and looking at their family history and a variety of other things that go into doing a diagnosis. 
The second area of hope is in the area of genetics and risk factors. The biggest risk factor, as I said, is age. Um, and yet, it's not an absolute predictor. The oldest um, documented person in the world was a French woman who died a couple years ago named Jean Calment. She died at age 122. At age 118, she had a, an exam and was found to be cognitively intact. So it's certainly possible to make it well beyond your 100th birthday and be cognitively intact. It's not an absolute predictor, but it's highly associated. Alzheimer's is highly associated with age. Other risk factors include Down syndrome, head trauma, and the older the mother, when the child is born, there seems to be some evidence that that may be a risk factor as well. Everybody's going to go back and check how old was my mother when I was born. It's, again, it's, it's one of, it's, it's a slight indicator. Um, in the area of genetics, we know that genetics and family history can be a risk factor. The best understood genetic factor is called apolipoprotein E, APOE. And in a group of, uh, you take a group of people with Alzheimer's disease, 35% of them will have that, will be carrying that gene. But it's not predictive. You can be very old, have the gene, and not have Alzheimer's disease. So it's still not a predictor. But there's enormous work that's been done in the genetics of Alzheimer's and understanding the genetic uh, basis of the disease. And finally, the most exciting developments in Alzheimer's research are in the area of treatment. Several years ago, we didn't talk about treating Alzheimer's disease, except in the kinds of behavioral things that, that we can do. There were no real treatments to speak of available. Now, there's enormous hope in this area. There are two drugs that have been approved by the FDA that are symptomatic drugs. They don't change the course of the disease, but they can enable people to function a little bit better, uh, certainly in the early to mid stages of the disease. The most exciting area is in preventing the disease. The National Institute on Aging, in conjunction with Pfizer Pharmaceuticals, just launched a major national trial uh, to, with people who are mildly cognitively impaired. They have significant memory problems, but don't yet have Alzheimer's disease. And they're testing two things. One is vitamin E, and the other is Dinepazil, uh, marketed under the name Aricept. It's a, a, a um, cholinesterase inhibitor that Im seems to improve uh, mental functioning to some extent. Um, if those show promise, and there are, there's some indication that vitamin E may show promise for uh, delaying or preventing Alzheimer's disease, uh, that could have an enormous effect. There are also trials on uh, estrogen, ginkgo biloba, and um, several other compounds that are in the works. <clears throat> if we can delay, simply delay the onset of Alzheimer's disease by five years, we can cut its incidence in half. The reason being most people are elderly, and if we can delay its onset, the onset of symptoms, chances are they will die of something else before Alzheimer's hits. So it is possible to have a significant effect on this disease. Even if we eliminate or, or prevent Alzheimer's disease today, there are four million people that have it now, and we're not going to, to prevent it, so we have to have ways of taking care of people. And that leads us to the second topic, which is the hidden long-term care system. Rhoda Jaffe from Plymouth, Minnesota, is like many typical caregivers. She is 70 years old. Her husband, Paul, is 71 and is living with dementia. Rhoda is his full-time caregiver. She is a breast cancer survivor, uh, as of now, she says, has a heart ailment, osteoarthritis, and Graves' disease. The job of caregiving falls to wives and adult daughters. For the most part, uh, caregivers are female. Most are married and living with a spouse. Most are elderly, like Rhoda Jaffe, who have their own health problems, but carry an enormous load in caregiving. Nearly half work full-time. So the notion that people can do caregiving because they're not doing something else is a misnomer. The sandwich generation is a reality. Caregivers who are taking care of an elderly parent and trying to deal with children. In a recent study, one in three caregivers 
uh, had children at home, children or grandchildren living at home. Caregiving is a family affair. Linda Bogner Norton cares for her husband, Dick, who suffers from early onset Alzheimer's. Dick just turned 68 last month as in, and is in the final stages of this devastating disease. In her words, Dick lives at home with me and my entire life revolves around his care as he is totally dependent for all activities of daily living, is incontinent of urine and bowel, and requires 24 hour a day supervision and assistance. Our youngest son, Jason, came home from college and continues uh, to attend college part-time, work part-time, because he comes home every day to help with the caregiving responsibilities for his father. You know, we hear about the trade-offs between the elderly, we, we need to do something in public policy to help the elderly or kids or some other thing. We, we sort of break up our problems into these little segments, but families deal with these things as a whole. The problem of caring for a, for a grandparent or a parent is all part of the family experience, just like sending the child to college. And frequently those things come together with fa within families and create enormous difficulties. The trade-offs that many families make between paying for nursing home care for a parent or a grandparent and putting a child through college. So the next time a legislator says, well, we're dealing with kids' issues this year, remind them that kids' issues and Alzheimer's issues are all family issues. Informal caregiving lies outside the market economy and is socially and politically invisible. Therefore, its economic value is not generally acknowledged. Today, there are 26 million caregivers. This is not just of Alzheimer's, but of all chronic conditions. One in five, however, are caring for someone with Alzheimer's disease. The average amount of caregiving is 18 hours per week. That's about the equivalent of a half-time job. And it adds up to 24 billion hours annually of caregiving. Using an estimate of an average hourly wage that's sort of a split between the minimum wage and what you'd have to pay a home care worker, a recent study calculated the costs of caregiving to be valued at $196 billion a year. This is a lot more than what we spend on home health care. We spend about $32 billion a year. It's more than twice what we spend on nursing home care. It is the long-term care system in this country, family caregivers. In Oregon, there are more than 318,000 caregivers contributing 296 million hours of caregiving annually, and the value of that is $2.4 billion. For Alzheimer's, the amount of time that caregivers spend is much greater, and the intensity of care is much greater. It's much more difficult. They spend about 50% more hours than a typical caregiver, more likely to help with meals, outside services, finances, and medicines. And among older caregivers, they are more than twice as likely to live with the care recipient and over five times as likely to be taking care of a spouse. The most difficult problem for an Alzheimer caregiver is seeing the progressive decline of the person. Coping strategies for these caregivers are prayer, and talking with friends and relatives. There are high levels of emotional and physical stress associated with caregiving. Caregivers are twice as likely to report physical and mental health problems because of caregiving. Catherine Brewer from Northport, New York, cared for her husband Howard at home for four years. During that time, he became increasingly difficult to care for. He often wandered off <coughs> and um, as people with Alzheimer's are inclined to do. She continued to work using adult daycare to allow her to go to work during the day, but finally it became too much for her. She testified a few years ago in this way. On, on April 26th, everything fell apart. After Howard left for daycare, I, I fell while I was out on a morning walk. To this day, I can't tell you how it happened. I never should have hurt myself, but there I was with a seriously damaged arm that would take bone grafts and months of recovery. This is what the experts call stress-related injury. As they wheeled me into surgery that morning, all I could think of was that Howard was coming home at four to an empty house. One in three caregivers use medications to deal with caregiver-related problems. Depression is three times as uh, likely among caregivers as it is for the norm uh, for people in that age group. 
Most people go into a nursing home not because they become sicker, but because the caregiver simply can't do it any longer. Elaine Millen of Galesburg, Michigan, has cared for her husband, Stuart, since 1990. A former Lutheran minister, Stuart is now in the late stages of the disease. She cared for him at home as long as she could. In her words, in the end, I couldn't care for him at home. Um, I, in the end, I couldn't care for him at home. He would never sleep for more than a few hours at a time. And of course, when he was up, I had to be up too. My daughter, Paula, would come and stay with her dad for 24 hours once a week while I rested at her house. That enabled me to keep Stuart home longer, but finally I just wore out. He's now in a nursing home. There are enormous financial costs related to caregiving, the cost of supplies, incontinent supplies, drugs, uh, getting, paying for some help, uh, the eventual nursing home costs that, that many people have to incur. And of course, many people work, and there are costs of uh, having someone either in a daycare center or bringing somebody in to cover for you while, while you're at work. The average lifetime cost of Alzheimer's disease is $176,000. That's the life average for an individual. But there are cases, there's one case uh, reported to me recently of an experience that lasted for 20 years and cost the family $560,000. You know, we don't think about Alzheimer's disease being a business problem, but there is an impact of Alzheimer's on business, and much of that is because we're t the, the impact of caregiving in Alzheimer's disease. More than half of Alzheimer's caregivers are employed and, and more than half of those report having to go in late, leave work early, or take time off during the day to provide care. A recent study calculated the cost to business, annual cost to business of Alzheimer's disease at $33 billion a year. And the reason for that is absenteeism, uh, productivity losses, replacement costs, additional usage of employee assistance programs. This was a study that calculated those very carefully and found that there is an impact on business related to this disease, even though it primarily hits people at older ages. Ralph McKinney was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in the early 70s. He worked in a rayon factory in Ohio and was forced to take an early retirement. As his confusion increased, his wife Louise quit her own job to care for him. Louise struggled alone with increasing demand for care and the heartache of living with someone who could no longer recognize her. Desperate for some relief, she brought Ralph to Portland to live with his son, Monty. Another son, Kevin, lived close by and the sons thought that together they could manage, at least until their mother was able to recharge her batteries. How wrong they were, caring for Ralph was an around the clock operation. He'd turn on the stove and walk away with pots burning. He would overload the cook stove, the wood stove, until it glowed. He was incontinent and he frequently wandered off. Within two months of Ralph's arrival in Portland, Monty left his job and devoted his time to caring for his dad. Kevin, who was working to put himself through graduate school, gradually cut back on his hours and his classes to provide backup care and eventually quit his job. Four people taken out of the labor force because of this disease. I'd now like to talk to you briefly about several policy issues related to long-term care and caregiving. There's a growing awareness in the nation about the value of caregiving. There, I think we're seeing more attention to this issue. Politicians are beginning to talk about it. They see it as a, as a politically uh, valuable issue because so many families have experienced this or know someone that has. There is federal legislation in, uh, that was uh, offered up by President Clinton to provide a $1,000 tax credit for caregiving. There's some other programs in his proposal, but we've been told that if there is a tax bill this year in Congress, that it will include the t this caregiver tax credit. There's a lot of bipartisan support for providing at least some help to care caregivers as small as it might be. And here in, in Oregon, there's legislation HB 2495, introduced by Ken Strobeck, which would be a $1,500 credit against personal income taxes for taxpayers providing unreimbursed care. That bill would cost $6 million annually, 
but would have enormous positive impact. But I say million, I, sometimes being in Washington, I confuse million and billion, but <laughs> it's million. <laughs> um, the, uh, I'm, I'm happy to report that the House Human Resources Committee just yesterday uh, read the bill and reported it positively. The chairman of that committee said it was an excellent bill and uh, it looks like it's, it's got some momentum now as it moves through the House and then on to the Senate. It's appropriate that uh, from the state's point of view that this isn't just a good thing to do because it helps people. Occasionally we do the right thing for the right reason, but there are enormous cost uh, benefits to the state for doing this. Uh, $1,500 can mean a lot to a caregiver, not only in the kinds of respite that they might be able to, to acquire, 150 hours of in-home respite companion care, uh, $1,500 would provide 75 afternoons of respite, or it might provide 37 and a half days, roughly three days a month of full, a full day respite care for that $1,500, so it can be spread a long ways. But respite care, uh, in addition to giving the caregiver a break, can also delay institutionalization. And since many people that go into nursing homes go in and the, and the care is paid for under Medicaid, if you can delay the institutionalization of a person, not only staying in an environment they'd prefer to be in, but it can save the state money. There are two studies. One found that respite for mild and moderate um, Alzheimer patients can delay nursing home replacement, uh, uh, nursing home placement, and can save about $1,800 per person. And if you apply that to the nation as a whole, could save $2 billion a year. Another study found that counseling and support for family caregivers can delay institutionalization by as much as a year. So this $1,500 tax credit or the $1,000 tax credit we're talking about in Washington can have positive payoffs. In 1995, nursing home costs in Oregon uh, exceeded $35,000 per year on average. The average per capita income in Oregon is about $25,000 a year, so you can, and much less for older people. You can see that most people, even with a year of income, can't pay for a year's worth of, of uh, nursing home care. So in addition to supporting caregivers, we have to find ways of paying for the enormous costs of long-term care, whether that be in institutions or otherwise. So we can't stop at tax credits. They're an important first step, but we've got to find a way to pay, help families pay for these enormous costs. Medicare doesn't cover it. Medicaid forces you to spend all your savings and go into basically into poverty. Private insurance is available, but it's very expensive. By the insurance industry's own data, Two-thirds of the elderly can't afford private insurance policies, and most younger people don't see it in their interest to buy a policy they may or may not need 30, 40, 50 years from now. Um, so we've got to find ways of dealing with this that involve Medicare and Social Security and housing policy and savings and insurance so that families are not bankrupted. Finally, what does this mean to you? I would encourage all of you to do what you can to support the research side of this equation, that's after all the only way that we're going to be able to completely eradicate the impact of Alzheimer's disease on our society, uh, whether through the Alzheimer's Association funding of research. We fund $16 million in research this year. Next year it'll rise to $23 million. And the federal government is now devoting $400 million a year to Alzheimer's research, thanks in no small part to Senator Hatfield's advocacy. We're trying to increase that by 100 million this year to step up our efforts in preventing the disease. <laughs> Secondly, support for the caregiver legislation at the federal level. Here in Oregon, you've got a terrific opportunity to see help for caregivers to prop up this important hidden long-term care system. <clears throat> and it's a, a small price to pay, uh, I think. Uh, third, the importance of long-term care financing, and there I think what we've got to do is get our national leaders to begin to talk about this issue. And we've got a great opportunity for that. There's a presidential election in the year 2000. It's already started, by the way, if you hadn't noticed. I hope it's not affecting you as much as it is us in Washington. But um, candidates should be encouraged to talk about long-term care. What are you going to do about this problem of long-term care? Uh, so, we, so we engage it as a national community and begin to solve it as a national community. And finally, I would encourage your support 
for the local Alzheimer's chapter, the Oregon Trail chapter. They do a terrific job of providing support uh, for families and information and advocacy and raising money for research. Uh, they are terrific. And they are now leading the fight on this caregiver legislation. In conclusion, Alzheimer's is referred to as the endless funeral. And it touches many more than the individuals with the disease. Nancy and Maureen Reagan are affected by this. Mrs. Millen and her daughters, Monty and Kevin McKinney. Families, children, parents and spouses, other relatives are affected in many ways by this disease as they contribute to this hidden long-term care caregiving system. As a community, we have to work together to solve the mysteries of Alzheimer's disease, and we must provide financial, emotional, and physical support to those who silently suffer from the stresses of caregiving. They do their jobs out of love and devotion, not because they have to, but because they choose to. But if we don't provide some support for this $196 billion caregiving system, it will crumble. And we can't deal with the implications of that, I can assure you. Finally, I started with Senator Hadfield, and I want to conclude with him. Uh, speaking at the 1994 Public Policy Forum in Washington, his words offer insight into why, as a nation, we are able to come together and address our problems, whether they be Alzheimer's disease or uh, other afflictions. In his words, I'd like to share with you some thoughts of a son of an Alzheimer's victim who went through those periods of loneliness, at times scared about what to do or what not to do, and to say that out of that which bonds us together, we're indeed in a very unique relationship. We're not adversaries. We're not even co-advocates. I suppose that the bond is really the bond of suffering, the bond of helplessness that we have each experienced. And in many ways, that bond, of course, blooms into love and compassion. That is the story of America's hidden long-term care system and why we must and will find ways to support it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McConnell. You have answered lots of questions, and I know that uh, Pete Heuser and I are not the only ones in this room who have experienced this firsthand within our own families. Uh, one of the things that you, you talked about quite a bit toward the end was the need to find a system, the need for policymakers to really you know, develop a system uh, to pay for the long-term costs of care. And uh, rather than, I, I know that the policymakers are, are really going to have to come to grips with this, but I'd like to know uh, if you have some specific ideas about what that system might look like or what the pieces of that system might be. I have lots of ideas, and uh, only some of them are politically viable. So I don't know whether to talk to you about all of them or just the politically viable ones. The fact of the matter is we need a system that doesn't depend on how wealthy you are or how unlucky you are to be able to afford long-term care. Uh, we probably should find an insurance-based way to deal with this that allows us to spread the cost. Now, we do that with Medicare. We do that with Social Security. Everybody contributes. Everybody gets something. There's a great reluctance to develop a new social insurance program today. So I suspect what we'll see is, first of all, we have to support the system that exists now, the family caregivers. We have to do something to make sure that doesn't fall apart. And we shouldn't replace it where it exists. We should support it. Secondly, we should um, beef up the Medicare program so that it takes care of people that have Alzheimer's disease. Uh, why is it that if you have heart disease and need bypass surgery, Medicare pays the $25,000 it costs. But if you have Alzheimer's disease, it won't pay a penny toward getting respite care or support for the caregiver, which means the person's health worsens and the caregiver's health worsens. So we need to make sure the programs that exist recognize what Alzheimer's is and deals with that in a better way. That can save money. 
And then finally, we've got to encourage people to, to save, to do what they can um, well enough in advance to cover the cost. But most people can't save enough to, 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 do their, to pay for their own long-term care. So there has to be a system, a way to spread the cost, whether it's through private insurance or public insurance or a combination of those. So uh, those are three things that I think are being discussed and um, unfortunately, because if, if they cost any money, there's a great reluctance to do much about them right now, unless people like you and your friends and neighbors rise up and say, we have to do something about it now. Well, Mr. McConnell, I'm Louis Simpson, and I'm a co-chair of the Health Care Committee. And my question to you is, uh, what about how prominent are these adult care centers around the country, and are they basically affordable as far as uh, you know, for families of modest means? Uh, the, the question about adult care facilities, there are things like uh, assisted living, which are residential facilities that are not, don't have the skilled nursing care available that a nursing home would have, but more, more home-like environment. Uh, those tend to be fairly expensive. They're, they tend to be directed to the upper end of the income scale. And for the most part, Medicaid doesn't pay much to, to help people be in those kind of facilities. Oregon uh, Medicaid system does something in, in that area. So many of those options are not affordable to people of modest means. And that, in some ways, needs to be our first priority in how we address long-term care costs, is let's make sure that people, that the first dollars spent go to people who need it the most. Uh, that may not be in the area of providing tax breaks for insurance, because if you can afford insurance, you may not actually need a tax break for it, but to support people in these uh, in various alternative settings. Um, <clears throat> Ned Luck, member of the club. Some years ago, a former governor of Colorado, Governor Lamb, probably ended a, a <clears throat> potential political career by saying too many of us are living too long. Apropos of that, I wonder if there isn't a solution when, when we have life with dignity where well, you can't have death with dignity. And many of us are of a feeling that that is a personal choice that should be extended. And I wonder to what extent this gets into <clears throat> the question and equation of how to uh, handle Alzheimer and allowing the families to make a decision in, in agony, but a decision that may be the best for all concerned. There are, there are a number of dimensions to this end of life issue. And uh, one of them has to do with whether a person should be kept alive artificially. And I think the courts, for the most part, public opinion, for the most part, supports uh, that people have a choice there and that we shouldn't, you shouldn't be hooked up to a tube and kept alive artificially unnecessarily. The Alzheimer's Association gives people the permission ethically to withdraw or withhold uh, artificial food and hydration. That issue, I think, is rising up in some parts of the country, but is, is more or less agreed to. There are issues about actively ending a person's life, and of course, Oregon uh, has the uh, assisted suicide legislation on the books. This is very complicated in general, but it's especially complicated for people with Alzheimer's disease. If you have advanced Alzheimer's disease, you can't make a decision at that point that you want to end your life. You had to make that decision earlier and tell somebody about it. So in effect, it becomes euthanasia for a person with Alzheimer's. That means it's much more complicated. The Oregon statute does not allow that. You have to be cognitively intact and reaffirm your decision right at the very end. A person with Alzheimer's can't do that. But what we can do is make sure that people aren't suffering, aren't in pain, that families have options so that everybody isn't pushed to the limit. And that's the kind of focus that I think we're, we're doing right now, to make sure that there's good palliative care for people and that people have options so that a person doesn't have to suffer at the end of their life. I don't buy it. <laughs> he doesn't buy it. <laughs> now, doctor, uh, you, you said that if you can afford the insurance, you don't necessarily need the tax break. Yes, I do. Um, I spent oh, probably at least a half a million dollars on my father that had Alzheimer's. 
for years. You can't pull a plug, they just lay there. You can't take care of them at home, you gotta put them in a, in a rest home. Uh, so consequently, my wife and I bought long-term care insurance. Have you lobbied the federal government because we can write off our medical insurance, but we can only write off $2,000 worth of uh, insurance premium for long-term care? Have you lobbied Congress to uh, make it equal, the same as any medical insurance? Well, it is equal in the sense that you can write off the premiums, though there is a limit to, only $2, yeah, there's limit. a limit by, based on age and so forth right. as to how much you can write off. One of the things we worked very hard on was to make sure that when you start collecting on that policy, that the money paid by the insurance company doesn't show up as income and you have to pay tax on that. We, were, we worked very hard on that. The issue about the tax deductibility of, in, of insurance premiums really comes down to a choice and right now, I think Congress is going to be facing this choice between should we provide a tax credit to caregivers for the direct care they're providing or a tax credit for the purchase of insurance? And, um, you know, that's a, that's a difficult choice, although I would argue, and many in the Alzheimer's Association would argue, that we need to help caregivers first, that we also have to deal with the future long-term care problems, encourage purchase to, the purchase of insurance, but that if you have a need for for long-term care insurance now, you can't buy a policy. I mean, it, it's, it's the nature of insurance. So any of the tax credits that we provide for premiums would not help anyone now with Alzheimer's or any other chronic condition. You buy it ahead of time, which we did. Right. And, and I think that's very good, and I think people that can afford it should do that. Um, and in fact, one of the things um, in this package of legislation that the president offered up is for federal workers to have uh, the government be a purchaser and negotiate rates. And they think they can get the rates down by 25, 30 percent, which may encourage people at younger ages to buy insurance at a much cheaper premium. That's, that's the trick. If we don't get young people now in their 40s to buy this, it won't happen because most people, by the time you wait till, you, till you're 65 or the average age of purchase now is 68 for private insurance. It's very expensive, so. So is a rest home at $40,000 yeah, a you. year. I hear you. Thank you. Ruth Robinson, club member. You spoke about the uh, need for uh, research for uh, prevention or, or whatever. Um, would you comment on the number of organizations that are providing this research? Uh, where I'm coming from is if I wanted to make a contribution, uh, are there some organizations that are on the list and some maybe are less responsible? Uh, tell me what my choices are if I want to contribute. Well, I can tell you, as far as I'm concerned, there's only one on the list. I, I really, <laughs> I'm really not in a position that... <laughs> uh, there, are, there are other organizations that are raising money for Alzheimer's research as well as other diseases. The Alzheimer's Association is the only organization devoted to this. It's the largest. It, it's second to the federal government, provides the most support. And uh, I can say, even if I didn't work for the association, that uh, it's a great place to make a contribution because it, it uh, as I said, we're, we're funding uh, very high quality research. Uh, we aren't doing it ourselves. We're giving it to researchers all over the country. So uh, if you're interested in how to make a contribution, right. okay. Um, Liz McKinney is right there. She's the executive yes. director of the Oregon Trail chapter. She can tell you exactly how to do that, and you can do it through the chapter or a variety of other ways. Okay. I think I had a sort of a hidden part to my okay. question. Okay. I thought you might. Uh, <laughs> in the case of cancer and some other diseases, we hear about groups springing up that are less than responsible and that, that use a very high percentage of the donation for their internal costs. Is there any kind of a list of the bad guys that we would want to avoid? Um, there, is, there are two entities that rate uh, nonprofit organizations, and I can't remember the formal names. Do you, Liz doesn't either, but there are two organizations that do that, and they will tell you what percentage of the money raised goes for administration and fundraising and what goes to program. And I'm sure we can get that information. The chapter will get you that so you can look at it. And I would encourage anybody making a contribution to look at those data. Money Magazine periodically puts out a rating. 
uh, but they're done by uh, two watchdog organizations, at least two, and our organization um, uh, gets a certification from those organizations in terms of an appropriate amount for administration. We don't let our administrative costs exceed 25 percent. So three-fourths of everything that's raised goes into uh, directly helping people. Thank you. Sure. <clears throat> Earl Zimmerman, uh, member of the uh, City Club and also Associate Director of the Alzheimer's Research Center in Portland at OHSU. I just want to expand a little bit on the risk factors. Uh, one is the tutor on horn that uh, we discovered a second one here two years ago and uh, it seems to hold up and that's HLIA2. Um, these risk factors are very interesting as you point out and, and uh, we believe as do others that they regulate the onset, the timing of onset of disease. So if you have the genetic factor E4, APOE4, it moves it up five years earlier as a population. If you have HLA2, it moves up five years and if you have both, it moves it up ten years. The second interesting thing about these risk factors that they give us, it probably will give us clues as to where to look for drugs and we're to target drug experiments. Uh, so we guess that E4 may be a repair problem and perhaps uh, makes you more susceptible to head injury. Uh, HLA2 would suggest an immune mechanism and you know the story about ibuprofen. And I think in the future we'll see targeted drug trials to those people with, with uh, various uh, genetic risk factors. Thank you. Thank you. you. You just heard from a real expert on that subject. Uh, but I appreciate the work that you're doing and the work that's being done in universities around the country. It's, it's really very exciting. Do we have time for one, one last more? question, please? Hi, I'm Susan Pierce. I'm a member, and I'm also a home health and hospice nurse for um, one of our sponsors, actually. Um, you spoke a little about vitamin E. Can you talk about some of the, I, I see a lot of, Alzheimer's patients and families who have interests and concerns. Can you talk about maybe some non-drug, non-chemical things we can yeah. do with our lives and our diets? Um, thank you. It's important that we're so pill-oriented in this society. We're going to find a pill and it's going to fix the problem. The fact is there are things that, there's some evidence that, that physical and mental exercise can keep us functioning better. We don't know yet whether that actually delays onset of Alzheimer's, but it enables, at least enables the brain to accommodate the disease. There's some evidence that people with higher education levels seem to, may have a slightly less likelihood of developing Alzheimer's. It's not, uh, it's not a uh, widespread finding, but again, we don't know whether that's because education, use of the brain may prevent Alzheimer's or whether it just allows you to, to work around it. We know that parts of the brain can die and you, and you can develop other parts around it. There are also lots of um, things that, and, and on vitamin E, I haven't heard a single researcher say you shouldn't be taking vitamin E. There's re no reason not to take it. I take it for 16 different reasons, but um, <laughs> at any rate, uh, there are also behavioral things that can be done when a person develops symptoms that aren't drug related, but can help ease the symptoms of the disease. Thank you for coming today. We appreciate you coming all the way out. He says he came out to speak to us at noon and also has other business in Southern California. He was thinking, looking at it from the East Coast vision, that is everything's close together here. But we're happy to have you here at any rate. Um, and uh, even though every afternoon is sunny here, this Friday afternoon, I think we all ought to celebrate it by taking off the rest of the day. Thank you.